as well. Let's get into the Word. We're in 1 Samuel chapter 10. If you haven't already, you can turn there. We're going to pick it up in verse 7. Last week we only made it uh, through to verse 6. So as you're turning there, I'll kind of get you up to speed. Uh, last week we saw the anointing of Saul and the prophesying to Saul uh, by Samuel when the Holy Spirit, we're told, came upon him. We did a, uh, a teaching on and a study of the baptism of the Holy Spirit, the upon of the Holy Spirit, and so much so that when uh, Saul was had the baptism of the Holy Spirit, if you will, when the Holy Spirit had come upon him, the text says that he was turned into another man, completely different. We're going to see here momentarily that the Holy Spirit had given him a new heart. He was a new person because the Holy Spirit had come upon him. Now, Samuel had anointed Saul and prophesied to Saul because he knew that Saul needed the confirming that comes vis-a-vis -vis the prophesying. In other words, when the prophecies that he gave would come to pass, that would be a confirmation for Saul that indeed this was the Lord's call on his life and not just the calling of the Lord but the empowering and the enabling from the Lord that comes vis-a-vis -vis the anointing and the filling of the Holy Spirit. So the takeaway just to sort of sum it up from verses 1 through 6 was that God will always package his calling with his enabling. John says in the New Testament that the commands of the Lord are not burdensome. Uh, and aren't you glad? God doesn't just uh, command us or call us and then just say to us, all right, you're off. <laughs> you're on your own. Wish you the best. Uh, hope you do well. No. He calls us. He commands us. But he packages with it the enabling and the empowering to do that which he's called us to do. He never sends us out without the enabling to do that which he's calling us to do. So why don't we pray? We'll ask God's blessing on our time and then we'll pick it up in verse 7. <sighs> Lord, settle us and focus us on you and on your word and that which you have for us here in your word tonight. Lord, many of us, as is usually the case, especially during this time of the year, come here <laughs> after a real hectic day and a hectic week in the busyness of the season. And this represents for us a sanctuary of sorts, a solace, really, where we can just put all of that aside and come here and get fed and get filled and get ministered to and so Lord we're wanting for you tonight to speak to us show to us that which you would desire for us to see Lord and I pray that when you do that our eyes would see our ears would hear and our hearts would receive so, Lord, will you do that? We're asking you in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, let's jump in. Verse 7. Samuel speaking says, And let it be when these signs, speaking of the prophesying, come to you, that you do as the occasion demands, for God is with you. You, verse 8, shall go down before me to Gilgal, and surely I will come down to you to offer burnt offerings and make sacrifices of peace offerings. And interesting, he says, seven days you shall wait till I come to you and show you what you should do. So it was, verse 9, when he had turned his back to go from Samuel, that God gave him, and here it is, another heart. 
And all those signs came to pass that day again as a confirmation. And this is really what Samuel is doing for Saul. He's confirming for him and he's being reassuring of him that these signs coming to pass would be evidence that this was indeed the Lord. And in addition to the confirmation that God was with him, interesting, Saul says to him, you need to wait seven days, the number of completion. And the reason was, is that it needed to be an evidence on Saul's part that he was in submission to the Lord. Now this might trigger a memory later on in Saul's life, really at the end of Saul's life, when he refuses to wait the needed time because no longer is he submitted to the Lord, he's in rebellion. And then when Samuel finally does come, it will lead to the end of his rule as king. I think this speaks to the importance of waiting on the Lord. So hard to do, especially for those of us who are impatient. Anybody want to admit that, right? I know none of you are. Okay, I'm speaking for myself. Okay, just a couple of you are honest about that. I mean, don't, let's be honest. We hate to wait, right? I know I hate to wait. Uh, and, you know, it's kind of like the, the fruit of the Spirit in Galatians, you know, love, joy, peace, gentleness, kindness, meekness, patience, self-control. I mean, it's, it is a, a fruit, not a gift. I wish it was a gift, because it would be something that God could just gift you and give you at the time that you need it. No, it's a fruit, which means that it has to grow over a period of time. <laughs> it's like that one prayer Lord give me patience and give it to me now <laughs> verse 10 when they came there to the hill there was a group of prophets to meet him then here it is again the spirit of God like in verse 6 came upon him and he prophesied among them. And it happened, verse 11, when all who knew him formerly saw that he indeed prophesied among the prophets, that the people said to one another, what is this that has come upon the son of Kish? Is Saul also among the prophets? Then verse 12, a man from there answered and said, But who is their father? Therefore it became a proverb. Is Saul also among the pro prophets? And verse 13, when he had finished prophesying, he went to the high place. Interesting. It's, it's what they're saying is, uh, this can't be Saul. Not the same Saul that we know. This son of Kish. That, that's, not, that's not him, is it? He, that's not, he can't talk like that and prophesy like that. And I mean, and so this, this proverb, it, it became a saying. Kind of like, I hate to use this expression, I know it's not, not kosher, but it's kind of like the saying, well, I'll believe that when pigs fly. Yeah. I'll let you have some time with that one, but that's kind of the, they, they couldn't believe it. They were utterly and totally <laughs> astonished at this Saul, this son of Kish, who all of a sudden now is prophesying as the prophets and with, with the prophets. Well, here's, here's what I'm thinking. <laughs> is this not how it is for us? Remember what it was like when you first came to Christ and your old friends who knew you before Christ see you after you come to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ? And are they not utterly astonished? I remember after I came to Christ, one of my uh, best friends said, oh, this is a phase you're going through. I thought, really? And 15 years later, uh, he calls me up and says that, uh, you know, he had given his life to Christ. And it was one of those, you know, divine opportunities and moments in a sanctified way I was able to say to him 
oh, I guess 15 years later, you don't think it's a phase anymore, do you? Because <laughs> he was watching me all those years to see if this was the real deal or not. And they were, you know, so blown away at, because they knew me before, and all of a sudden I'm born again and filled with the Spirit, and I talk different, I am different, I have a new heart, I'm a new cre creation <laughs> in Christ. Behold, old things have passed away. And it's perplexing to people, isn't it? Uh, they just can't wrap their mind around it because they don't have the spiritual eyes to discern this spiritual thing that has happened. And all of a sudden they see us now interested in the things of God, the Word of God, and going to church. Oh my goodness, one of the uh, most baffling things to my friends from before I came to Christ was that I would go to church not just every week, but two and three times a week. And they were just baffled by that. And it was because I wanted to. And I was there when the doors opened and they had to kick me out so they could close those doors. And I just loved being there and I couldn't get enough. And it, they just couldn't understand that. And that's what's happening here with uh, Saul. Now it's important to understand that this prophesying that Saul uh, was, you know, uh, giving was not a prophecy in the sense of future events. Rather, it was a gift of the Spirit that when the Spirit had come upon him, that instead of really making future predictions, it was more for present edification. This is 1 Corinthians 14.3. But everyone who prophesies speaks to men for their strengthening, encouragement, and comfort. You know how it is when sometimes a brother or sister in Christ will have that word fitly spoken and they'll speak it, you know, uh, prophetically and it's kind of like, wow, how did you know that? That was for me. And it doesn't just happen from pulpit to pew, by the way. It happens, you know, brother to brother and sister to sister. Sometimes God will speak that word through that brother or sister in Christ. It's a prophetic word. It's a word fitly spoken, and it comes vis-a-vis -vis the Holy Spirit. And that's what this was. Verse 14. I could, should probably turn this fan down. I'm getting Holy Spirit wind noise on the microphone. Verse 14, Then Saul's uncle said to him and his servant, Where did you go? So he said, To look for donkeys. Remember the donkeys? That this is what you know, God used to you know, divinely bring and lead Saul to Samuel. He used lost donkeys. So remember now, we, we've been kind of following these donkeys, looking for these donkeys. We were told that they had been found and for Saul not to worry about it. So he's now telling his uncle that, you know, kind of how this whole thing went down. He says, it all started when we went to go look for the donkeys. And he says, when we saw that they were uh, now here to, or nowhere, to, now here, nowhere, to be found, we went to Samuel. And interesting, Saul's uncle said, verse 15, tell me, please, what Samuel said to you. So Saul, verse 16, said to his uncle, he told us plainly that the donkeys had been found, but about the matter of the kingdom, he did not tell him what Samuel had said. Wow, why not? <laughs> why, why wouldn't you just be excited to tell your uncle all about how that the prophet Samuel anointed you and the Holy Spirit came upon you. And so why wouldn't he tell his uncle anything about what had happened? A couple thoughts. It's interesting in reading some of the commentaries. There, there's several thoughts here, but uh, one of them is that Saul may have, and this is giving him credit, that he may have wisely wanted to just wait on the Lord in his time to reveal 
that he had been anointed as king instead of him doing it himself. Uh, in other words, if he would have told his uncle, hey, let me check this out. Samuel anointed me. I'm going to be the king of all of Israel. <laughs> and, <laughs> you know, uncle is going, uh, wow, uh, you need to get, get out more, uh, Saul. And so he, he would have, you know, likely uh, doubted it. So, in other words, he was waiting for the Lord to do it in his way and in his time so that there would be no doubt that in fact he was anointed. Now that gives Saul uh, a lot of credit. Here's a second thought, uh, less spiritual uh, certainly. It's that like many new believers uh, after coming to Christ, uh, he was just afraid to, and even ashamed to, you know, say anything about it. He, w he was what, you know, we, we call them today an undercover Christian. Yeah, you know. <laughs> we don't want anybody to know. We're just kind of under the radar, and, and uh, yeah, that's possible. But another thought, as one commentator suggests, is that Saul was pondering all that had happened in his heart between the Lord and himself, which again kind of gives him uh, you know, the credit here, the benefit of the doubt, but whatever the reason, each of them has personal application to our lives today such that we either wisely wait and ponder and let the Lord do it in His way and in His time and for His glory, or we foolishly fear and falter instead and like Paul writing to the Romans we're ashamed of the gospel and we don't want people to know because we fear what their response and reaction will be it's usually scorn and ridicule and mocking that comes with it verse 17 then Samuel called the people together to the Lord at Mizpah Verse 18, and said to the children of Israel, Thus says the Lord God of Israel, I brought up Israel out of Egypt and delivered you from the hand of the Egyptians and from the hand of all kingdoms and from those who oppressed you. But, verse 19, you have today rejected your God who himself saved you from all your ad adversities and your tribulations and you have said to him no <laughs> set a king over us now therefore present yourselves before the Lord by your tribes and by your clans boy the Lord does not want them to forget how this whole thing came about and he does not want them to forget how it is that they had rejected him as their king ruling over them in spite of all that God had done. Uh, maybe you'll indulge me for just a bit. Uh, I just want to share with you some, some thoughts here. Uh, I was kind of musing over this and, and I was thinking about how Saul <laughs> must have felt about this. Uh, and think about this, right? Um, I wonder if it bothered him that he was anointed, the only reason he was anointed as Israel's king was because God himself was rejected as Israel's king. Listen, if I'm Saul, I don't want to be king that way. I mean, for a number of reasons, not the least of which is I've got some omnipotent, omniscient, and omnipresent shoes to fill. How would you like to succeed God, the creator of the heavens and the earth and the sea and all that in them is as king, all because he was rejected as king. How would you feel? I'm thinking to myself, you know what? <laughs> Pass. And actually, we're going to see his reluctance here uh, shortly, and it's understandable. We're even going to see him here in a moment running and 
hiding when God finally publicly appoints him and anoints him, sort of deputizes and authorizes him in, uh, publicly there for the Israelites so that they'll know that God has anointed him the king. And where's Saul? It says in some of our translations, render it, he's hiding amongst the stuff. <laughs> no, I don't want to do this. Anyway, I'm getting ahead of myself. That's, uh, we'll see that here shortly. I want to take it a step further, though, and suggest that along these lines, this may have very well been the reason that Saul was so insecure and unsure concerning all of this, which may also be the reason that uh, Samuel went to such an extent to prophesy uh, and confirm uh, that this was in fact the Lord. And uh, again, in all fairness to Saul, as we just saw in the verses prior, uh, this may have been why he wanted to wait for the Lord to, you know, sort of confirm it in the eyes of the children of Israel. Now, the Israelites had rejected God as their king, but Think about this, God had anointed and accepted Saul to be the Israelites' king instead. Uh, never underestimate uh, how it is that Saul got off to a great start, a good start. I mean, it, he didn't end well, obviously. Uh, for those of you who went to Israel with us, when we were at Beit Shean, one of the best uh, sites in terms of archaeological digs. You can still see the, we walked on the very streets and the, the pillars, but it was at Beit Shean where, uh, and we'll see that th this at the end of uh, Saul's life, but the Philistines uh, nailed his body to the walls there in Beit Shean. How tragic. He started off so well and he ended that way. Well, but God had accepted Saul, even though Israel had rejected him. And I'm of the belief that this accepting of Saul was more of an indictment on the Israelites than it really was on Saul. And here's why I say that. Saul is not himself choosing to replace God as their king, rather God is himself choosing Saul to replace him as their king, as he was rejected by the Israelites. Here's the point. Sometimes, <laughs> and, and hear me out on this, sometimes, and you know exactly what I'm going to be talking about here, God will appoint a ruler over the people as a judgment upon the people who of their own volition reject him. I'm going to leave it there <laughs> for what I think would be deemed obvious reasons. Charles Spurgeon says, this is only one form of a common evil among the Lord's people. They cannot walk by faith, pure and simple, but want some intermediate arm to lean upon they are not spiritual enough to rest content with the invisible God. Providence is not enough for many. They must have visible treasure. Neither are they satisfied with the Lord's aid, but cry out for an arm of flesh, a man. To such, the Lord often sends that which they seek for, and it becomes a plague to them, just as Saul became rather a curse to Israel than a blessing. When we pray, we ought ever to say, not as I will, but as thou wilt, lest the Lord should answer us in anger and give us the desire of our hearts to be a solemn chastisement for our presumption. This was the judgment of God for rejecting God. God was giving them over to their flesh 
wanting that arm of flesh, as Spurgeon says, verse 20. And when Samuel had caused all the tribes of Israel to come near, the tribe of Benjamin was chosen. When he had, verse 21, caused the tribe of Benjamin to come near by their families, the family of Matri was chosen, and Saul, the son of Kish, was chosen. But when they sought him, (laughs) this is where he's running and hiding, he could not be found. Now, you'll forgive me for maybe being a little bit too hard on Saul, but it seems to me that... Now, this is not humility. We'll talk about that here in a moment. This is insecurity. He is so insecure that when the time comes, he runs and he hides. And you'll also forgive the humor (laughs) that I see in this, but uh, it seems that Saul, I mean, what is he thinking? That, hey, if I go hide that, you know, maybe God will realize, you know what, he's really reluctant, he's really insecure, you know, I ought to probably just find somebody else. And then I won't have to do this. Because I really don't want to do this. And, and we need look no further than to Jonah, right? <laughs> to realize the utter futility of thinking that we can actually run and hide from God. Uh, thinking maybe (laughs) that maybe God will, you know, kind of give up and find another. Not that God doesn't know where I'm at, but when he sees that I'm running and hiding and unwilling to heed the call and command, maybe he'll just go find somebody else who won't be so reluctant. I mean, I think that's really the why behind the what, if you will, with Jonah. I mean, that's the only thing I can really kind of come up with to reconcile, you know, how it is that he would go to such an extent. I mean, it's just unthinkable to me that when he's on that boat thinking, oh, I got away, (laughs) you know, and all of a sudden here comes this storm and, you know, the other guys on the boat and the captain of the, of the ship are like, hey, you know, there's somebody on this boat. And so Jonah knows exactly what's going on. And he says, you guys, it's me. So just throw me overboard to my certain death. I mean, in other words, he was willing to die so he wouldn't have to go to Nineveh. So he's, he's running from God and he's... And I, the only thing I can even come close to, you know, figuring out what would make him be willing to die and, and you know, instead of do this, is that he's thinking that maybe God will change his mind and say, you know what, Jonah, forget it. <laughs> you know, I'll, I'll find somebody else. And maybe that's what Saul is thinking. I think the enormity of what is about to happen with Saul is now starting to set in and he's you know kind of having for lack of a better term buyer's remorse (laughs) if or king's remorse if you prefer and is maybe looking for or at least hoping there's an out here's my point and here's where I'm kind of going with all this Uh, we're just like them. Let's, let's be honest. I mean, we're just as prone to be just as reluctant when it comes to God choosing and using us, calling and commanding us to do that which he's calling us to do because we think that we're not qualified. I can't do that. Well, you know what? You're right. You can't. But guess what? He can. Remember the three-step? We haven't had our three-step you know, program for a while. Hi, my name is JD. Hi, JD. <laughs> Here's the three steps. It's very simple. Number one, realize 
I cannot. Number two, step two, realize he can. Number three, very simple, let him. Let him. In fact, <laughs> I'm convinced I've experienced in my own life how it is that when I think I can, he'll just let me until I come to the end of myself and realize <laughs> this is impossible. And I just imagine the angels given charge concerning me laughing like, man, this dude just doesn't get it. If he would have come to that realization sooner, he could have saved himself so much unnecessary pain and suffering, self-inflicted difficulties. If he would have just surrendered at first and just let God do it instead of him trying in the energy of his own flesh. And see, this also presupposes that Saul thought that somehow it depended upon him. And it doesn't depend on him. God is going to choose him and use him, but it's not about him. And is that not what God does? He chooses the foolish things, the unqualified ones, the Saul's, the Jonah's. I mean, if I'm God, I would have not chosen Jonah. I've got a real problem with this guy right out of the chute, you know? I'm thinking, you know, he would have, at, at first when he's running, I would have thought, you know what, I made a big mistake, I pulled the wrong file, I'm going to, you know, forget it, I'm going to find somebody else. I'm not going to, I'm not in the mood for this. I'm just, you know, I'm too old for this, and so I'll just find somebody else who's actually wanting to do this. But he chooses the Jonas. Seemingly a foolish choice. Why? Because it's to confound the wise. This is 1 Corinthians 1, verses 26 through 29. Every pastor's resume is right here in this passage. Brothers, think of what you were when you were called. Not many of you were wise by human standards. Not many were influential. Not many were of noble birth. In other words, there was nothing really impressive about you. Never think for a minute that, oh yeah, God chose me because, well, you can't blame him. Have you seen my resume? Have you seen the degrees? Have you seen all the letters after my name? <laughs> he goes on to say, but God chose the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. God chose the weak things of the world to shame the strong. He chose the lowly things of this world and the despised things and the things that are not to nullify, bring to void, bring to naught the things that are. And he tells us why. It's so that no one may boast before him. This is what I love about Gideon. There was no way Gideon and all those before and after him could ever take the credit for what God did, even if they wanted to, because God did it in such a fashion, choosing the foolish, the weak. See, I know in my own life that there have been times where I've been too strong for God to use me, for God to be strong on my behalf. The Apostle Paul would boast in his weakness. Why? Because when I'm weak, then I'm strong in him, in the power of his might. See, if I'm strong in my own savvy, my own strength, my own smarts, my own abilities, then... I'm prone to take the credit and boast and no flesh will glory in his presence. God will never share his glory with any man. And this is why God chooses the Saul's. This is why God chooses the Jonah's. It's why God chooses the guys like Moses. This is his MO, if I can say it that way, his modus operandi, if that's how you pronounce it to make it sound fancy. But <laughs> when you, you know, throughout the pages of Holy Writ, see these men and women of God that God chooses and uses, the common denominator with all of them is that in and of themselves, they were really nothing. There was nothing impressive about them. 
They weren't in and of themselves strong and capable and even qualified. It's been said that God doesn't call the qualified. He qualifies the called. How many uh, are reluctant when it comes to the call that God has on their life? And they run sometimes for years from the calling of the Lord. And, and God is so patient with us. He's so gentle, you know, as the good shepherd. Isaiah says he doesn't snuff out a smoldering wick or break a bruised reed. He's very gentle with us. He just is patient with us. And he brings us to that place where we finally realize, wait a minute, whether I'm able or not is not even really the point. I mean, if I, I'm thinking that if it depends on my ability, my capability, well, no wonder I'm going to be reluctant. But when I realize that he's the one that enables me to do that which he's calling me to do, then the pressure's off. And I'm operating and functioning in the spirit and the power of the spirit and not in the flesh. And this is Moses, really. You think about it. His reluctance. He, he's arguing with God. I mean, here's God <laughs> appears to him from the burning bush. I love the text. I think it's the New King James that renders it. That he sees this bush on fire, and he notices that the bush is not being consumed by the fire. And the text says, he says to himself, I am going to go see this bush <laughs> that is not being consumed by the fire. And from that burning bush, God speaks to him and calls him 40 years later after being on the backside of the desert. And how reluctant is Moses? You know, 40 years prior, no problem. That's why he took matters into his own hands. I'm going to deliver my people. And he kills the Egyptian. And he's mortified when the Israelites look at him and going, dude, <laughs> what are you doing? And that was it. It was him doing it. So God's like, you know what? I got to send you to the backside of the desert university. Uh, B-S-D-U. Uh, <laughs> for 40 years. Not a four-year college. This is a 40-year college. And you're, I'm going to have to school you because I can't use you. Because you think it is you, and it depends on you, and it's up to you. It's not. I have to bring you to the end of yourself. And here's the difference, and I mentioned it uh, prior. With Moses, it was humility. His reluctance was because of his humility. We know of Moses that he was the meekest man who walked on the face of of the earth. You know, many uh, people are really hard on Moses, you know, because, you know, in the first five books of Moses, we read that, which means that he wrote that. I don't think he wrote that. I think Joshua inserted it parenthetically, that he was the meekest man. Because, you know, if, if you say of yourself, I'm the meekest man who ever walked on the face of the earth, <laughs> you're no longer meek anymore. <laughs> because all of a sudden now you're proud of your humility and you're apparently humble about your pride too because you would never say that. And the moment you do, you are no longer that. So again, I don't think he wrote it. But the point is, is that with Moses it was humility, but with Saul it was insecurity. In other words, the reluctance with Saul was birthed out of his insecurity, whereas with Moses, it was birthed out of his humility. But God still called them in spite of them. Because with both of them, it wasn't about them. And their reluctance was because they thought it was. I want to... Um, actually take you back to Exodus chapter 3. You can follow along if you want. If you uh, turn there, verse 10 through 12, and then we'll uh, take it actually to verse 14 here in a minute. But in verse 10, Exodus 3, it says, Come now, therefore, and I will send you to Pharaoh, that you may bring my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. But, verse 11, Moses said to God, listen to this, Who am I 
that I should go to Pharaoh and that I should bring the children of Israel out of Egypt. You see a pattern here? So he said, God speaks, I will certainly be with you. And interesting, this shall be a sign to you. Just like he gave a sign to confirm it for Saul, he's going to give a sign to confirm it for Moses as well, both of whom are reluctant. I will, it shall be a sign to you that I have sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you shall serve God on this mountain. <laughs> now, notice how instead of Moses saying, Here am I, he says instead, who am I? And it's not, here I am to save the day, <laughs> right? It's, who am I? I can't do this. Precisely. Exactly. Which is why I'm calling you. Because you can't. But I, <laughs> I can. And I will. Now, Unbeknownst to Moses, he's now usable to the Lord. Why? Because he's come to nothing. He's come to nothing, which is why the Lord, through him, can now do anything. God cannot do anything until we come to nothing. And we come to nothing when we realize that it's not who am I, it's who he is. And we'll see that here momentarily. Spurgeon says, The more fit a man is for God's work, the lower is his esteem of self. You know, as the years go by and the longer you serve the Lord, you realize, and the closer you get, to the Lord you realize how utterly unworthy you are we say and we pray and we sing Lord less of me more of you you know what it really is it's none of me and all of you it's all of you and it's all of grace I want to take it a little bit further here in verse 13 then <laughs> Moses said to God indeed when I come to the children of Israel and say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me to you. He's still kind of arguing with God, questioning God, sort of querying God, reluctant now as it relates to this call of God. So he, he says, when, when I say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me to you, and they say to me, well, what is his name? What shall I say to them? And verse 14, God said to Moses, now listen to this, I am who I am. <laughs> wow, that really clears it up. Thank you so much, God. That makes all the sense. And he said, thus you shall say to the children of Israel, and if you're following along, you'll notice it's capitalized, I am has sent me to you. That, that's it. That's all I'm supposed to say is I am. So they're going to ask me what your name is, God, and I'm going to say, I am. He's, I am, has sent me. I am, has sent me. <laughs> you know what's interesting? God never answers Moses' question of who am I. He doesn't even respond to it. And I'll tell you why that is. It's not who am I, it's whose I am. We got it backwards. It's not I, me, myself, and I. It's the one who says, I am. That's who. Not who am I. I am. <laughs> That's who. In other words, it's the other way around. Which is why God tells Moses, he will be with him. And he will give a sign to him. It's also interesting that what Moses is really concerned about, you know, the children of Israel asking, well, what's his name? That never happens at all. No one ever asks him what God's name is. They do, however, 
question whether or not God is really with Moses and if Moses is being used of God to deliver them out of the hands of the Egyptians. What's my point? My point is this. God's answer, which I know was puzzling to Moses, when he says, I am who I am, is God saying, I just am. In other words, he's saying he is because there was never a time that he wasn't. And there will never be a time when he isn't. I hope that's not too <laughs> gnarly. It's, it's, uh, but he's saying, I am all you need. Which is why it's not who am I, it's I am. And whatever you have need of, I am that for you. And will be that for you. I am all you need. Whatever you have need of, I am. Like we had just sung with that uh, Christmas song, uh, Mary, did you know that he would be the great I am? Uh, I want to talk about the seven I am's of God. Starting with this first one, these are oftentimes referred to the names of God, again, seven being the number of completion. We'll start with this first one, Jehovah Shalom, which means the Lord, our peace. And here's what I kind of want to do, and I'll run through these uh, relatively uh, fast. But like with Moses asking, who am I? It might be asked of us, Am I worried? The Lord would respond with, not am I, but I am Jehovah Shalom, the Lord, your peace. Jesus said, I come to give you peace, not as the world gives. It's not contingent on, predicated upon what's going on in your life. I am, I am your peace. How about this second one? Am I wandering? God's response would be, I am Jehovah Raha, the Lord your shepherd. He leaves the 99 and he finds the one. Am I lacking? Am I in want? I am Jehovah Jireh, the Lord your shepherd provider he will provide whatever we have need of and if it goes unprovided I would submit that it was probably unneeded because sometimes we take the label off of whatever we think we uh, need it's really a want and we take the want label off we switch it put a need label on it and sometimes you think you need something and then God doesn't provide it and you realize, you know what, that wasn't a need, that was a want. Because if it was a need, God would have provided whatever it was that I needed. The Lord is my shepherd and I shall not be lacking in want. Am I defeated? I am Jehovah Nisi, we talked about this Sunday in Romans 16, the Lord, our victor, or our victory, the battle belongs to the Lord, we say, and we sing. Am I guilt-ridden? This is a biggie. Am I riddled with guilt and, and condemnation? I am Jehovah Sidkenu, the Lord our righteousness. This is Christ's imputed righteousness. This is not a self-righteousness. We cannot say, who am I? Am I righteous? No. He says, I am 
righteous. The only one who is righteous. Am I sick? I am Jehovah Rapha, the Lord, our healer. And seventh, am I helpless? I am Jehovah Shammah, the Lord, our present help. As the psalmist says, he's our present help, ever-present help in times of trouble. One commentator noted that this was clearly Jesus himself who was speaking from the burning bush, referring to himself as the I am. This is what we call a Christophany, a pre-Bethlehem appearance of the person of Jesus Christ. This is John 8, 58. I tell you the truth, Jesus answered, before Abraham was born, listen, I am. I am. He is the I am. It doesn't matter who I am because he's the I am. Never should I ever ask who am I that's not even a factor because he's the I am. Well, let's finish up the chapter, verse 22. Therefore, they inquired of the Lord further. <clears throat> Remember now, he's, he's hiding, he's running. Has the man come here yet? And the Lord answered, there he is, <laughs> hidden among the equipment or hidden, hiding among the stuff. <laughs> Verse 23, so they ran and brought him from there. And when he stood among the people, he was taller than any of the people from his shoulders upward. And verse 24, Samuel said to all the people, do you see him whom the Lord has chosen? That there is no one like him among all the people. So all the people shouted and said, long live the king. Then verse 25, Samuel explained to the people the behavior of royalty and wrote it in a book and laid it up before the Lord. And Samuel sent all the people away, every man to his house. And verse 26, Saul also went home to Gibeah and valiant men went with him whose hearts God had touched. And I wish it ended there. But we have a verse 27 where it says, but <laughs> some rebels said, you know you're off to a really bad start here. How can this man save us? So they despised him and brought him no presents. But he, speaking of Saul, held his peace. <laughs> what a way to end a chapter. It's this last verse that I want to bring tonight's Bible study to a close because it speaks practically and applicably to the matter of what we're to do when we're despised. What should be our response when we're attacked? Really, there's two truths woven into the fabric of this narrative, this last verse particularly, the first of which is simply let God defend you. Hold your peace. Let God defend you. As one so aptly said, if you defend yourself, God will let you. So just take care of your character and God will take care to defend your reputation. He is our defense. Let God defend you. It's been said that if you are prone to defend yourself, Satan will take particular note of it and seek to always get you to put out fires. Because once he knows that you're quick to, you know, uh you know, <laughs> defend yourself, he's got you. No, let, God can always do a much better job of defending you. Charles Spurgeon again said, this was a very sensible course of action. The man who can be quiet will defeat his enemies. Be not hasty to defend yourself or answer slanderous tongues. 
stand still and see the salvation of God. You know, it's interesting. Uh, actually, Spurgeon didn't just preach this. He practiced this. Uh, it's evidenced in this true story that I had happened upon uh, concerning both uh, Spurgeon and his wife. Uh, it's said of them that he and his wife would sell but refuse to give away the eggs their chickens had laid. Even close relatives were told, you may have them if you pay for them. As a result, some people labeled the Spurgeons greedy and grasping. They accepted the criticisms without defending themselves. And only after Mrs. Spurgeon died was the full story revealed. All the prophets from the sale of those eggs went to support two elderly widows. Because the Spurgeons were unwilling to let their left hand know what the right hand was doing, Matthew 6, 3, they endured the attacks in silence. Didn't defend themselves. Uh, F.B. Meyer expounds on Saul's silence in not defending himself. He writes that the Hebrew, as suggested by the margin, is still more striking. He, speaking of Saul, was as though he had been deaf. He pretended not to hear. He did hear. Every word had struck deep into his soul, but he made as though he were deaf. It is a great power when a man can act as though he were deaf to slander, deaf to detraction, deaf to unkind and uncharitable speeches, and treat them as though they had not been spoken, turning from man to God, leaving with God his vindication, believing God that sooner or later will give him a chance of vindicating the true prowess and temper of his soul. Easier said than done, is it not? You know the, the saying, sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me? Right! <laughs> I, that is not true. Sticks and stones may break your bones, but some unkind words can absolutely devastate you. Would to God that we would turn a deaf ear as if we didn't hear the slander, the accusations that come. And they do come well, that's the first one. Don't, don't defend yourself. The second one, I'm going to borrow from Spurgeon again, is simply this. We need to realize that it's impossible to please everybody. I mean, even if you, you know, theoretically could please everybody, then you would become the quintessential man-pleaser. And James makes it very clear in no uncertain terms that if we're a man pleaser, if the, all speak well of us, if we're friends with the world, we're an enemy of God. You cannot. It is utterly impossible. And if you try to please everyone, what will end up happening is you'll please no one. Again, Spurgeon no man may hope to please everybody. The man whom God himself points out is not the man for disaffected people. Saul was of good family, of noble stature, modest and unassuming, but all these things went for nothing with the malcontents. May none of us, now listen to this, this is classic Spurgeon, may none of us ever belong to that evil class of persons who are always in opposition, always fault-finding, never willing to work with anybody. This is not the mind of Christ, nor the fruit of the Spirit, which is ever peaceable. You know, some people just, I mean, they just can find a fault with anything. 
No matter how hard you try, you can never please them. There's a reason for that. You'll never please everybody. And if you try, you'll please nobody. I want to leave you with this story. I was thinking about the last time I told this. One of my favorite stories, it's kind of a fable, but it is so apropos in its uh, description of uh, how you can never please uh, everybody. It's um, actually you can search it online. There's different versions of it. Uh, The father, the son, and the donkey. Uh, I'm going to give you my version. Uh, Personally, I just think it's a little little better. Is that that bad? (laughs) It just is. The one is really weird at how it ends, but I'll let you go online. Just search the father, the son, and the donkey. You'll get it. I don't like how it ends. It's really uh, weird. But anyway, here's, here's my version. Okay, this is the JDV. All right, here we go. So this man and this, uh, his son uh, go into town to get supplies, and uh, this is in the olden days, and so they take their donkey, and on this particular day, the son is riding the donkey, and the father is walking beside the donkey, and as they get into town, they're met with the criticisms of the townspeople, and they hear them saying, look at this dad. I mean, look at this son. He, you know, he's young and strong and he makes his poor old father walk. He should, the father should ride the donkey. The son is young and strong. He can walk. So, well, they think, okay, you know what? Next time, son, we go into town. That's fine. I'll ride the donkey. Son, you walk. You're young. That's fine. So they go riding into town and the dad's riding the donkey and the son is walking. And sure enough, here's the townspeople. Look at that slave-driving father. Here he is riding the donkey in ease and comfort, and he makes his son walk what a slave driver. So they figure, okay, you know what? Let's, let's do this. Let's both ride the donkey, okay? That ought to solve it. That ought to make them happy. So they're both riding the donkey in the town, and the next time they go in for supplies. And sure enough, here's the townspeople. That poor donkey. They're going to break his back, man. What, they're both riding him, really? So, you know, the dad's like at a loss. He says, okay, you know what? Let's, I th- here's what we're going to do. Next time we go into town, neither of us are going to ride the donkey. We're both going to walk, okay? That ought to make him happy. That ought to please him, all right? Sure enough, they walk in the town. Neither of them are riding the donkey. They're both walking beside the donkey. And they ride in the town. Sure enough, here's the townspeople. Look at those stupid idiots. Here they have a donkey and they don't even ride him. The moral of the story, you can't please everybody. Try, you'll please nobody. Okay, what a way to end a Bible study. Why don't you go ahead and stand. We'll pray. <laughs> Lord, thank you. Thank you for the lessons that we can learn and the truths that we can apply to our lives from just this chapter here in 1 Samuel. Lord, will you now take it from here and by the Holy Spirit bridge the gap between the information and the application of that information. Lord, unless you build this into our lives, we're going to labor in vain trying in and of ourselves to do it. So Lord, make this real. We want to be named amongst those who instead of saying, who am I, would say that as a matter because he's the I am. Lord, we want to be numbered amongst those who would heed your call, not run and hide from your call. So Lord, will you enable us by the power of the Holy Spirit to do that and to be that. In Jesus' name, amen.